This time we have Jessica Pointer, one of the alumni from SIT fame system. Yep. Jessica will speak to us on the topic getting into development with high end experience in development requires patience and persistence. I'm also pleased that for the for this seminar we have the DC students participating and so we will get questions also from DC to, to Jessica and sooner or later we will be joined by the CISA leadership they have in a short meeting they want to join us also so ladies and gentlemen without wasting your time we have a short time to be here I'd love to welcome Jessica just go with it. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, let me see. What I'm, a lot of what I'm going to say here is not really new news, but I think that because of where I'm working and kind of the fact that development is a huge and important thing. A uh, field for SAT and for world learning, sorry, SAT Graduate Institute and world learning. Um, I know it's not easy to get one's foot in the door if you don't have any experience, but you've got the class work and you want to get the practicum, but you can't do the practicum in the right place until you know what it, you know, it's kind of this weird tautology that's really hard to overcome quite a bit. So I think from my own perspective, I wanted to talk about that and also based on the fact that I recruit for uh, development projects around the world. And uh, I used to work with this fine lady, Rebecca Bell, in graduate admissions. And one thing I always said to prospective students when they were coming to visit is I will not sugarcoat anything and I will tell you very honestly. Um, so feel free at any point to ask any questions at all whatsoever. There are very few things that are, I think, um, confidential for our company. Um, but aside from that, even if there are some things that are confidential, I can't say that I won't tell you what they are. Um, so anyway, if you want to go ahead and click over, Joe, just basically get started. Um, or not. Phil? Yeah. Phil stepped out to get a to get a, uh, a little remote for this. This is not a very long PowerPoint because I know y'all are probably drowning in that. But it's pretty straightforward stuff, as I mentioned. Look at this guy. He knows what But essentially, I guess my question is, what is development? And this is where I ask for your thoughts. What is development? Anybody? I know you're eating, but. I mean, Well, I think what we all hope to do is, you know, work with some kind of organization, whether it's nonprofit, governmental, or non-governmental, right? To do development work. Right. But my question is, thank you so much. Is what does development mean to you? How would you define it? How do you see yourself in it? Um, because you are more than your CV, and I think that that's hard to remember for folks who have my position when they're in other places or when you're on the other side of the resume send button when you send them in and you think, oh God, they're not even going to look at this. Um, but you are more than your CV, and I think it's incumbent upon the applicants or the person who really wants to get into the field to make themselves known as an individual and to meet people. And that's partly what I want to touch on today. Um, because you have to network. And if you don't, uh, you're kind of setting yourself up for um, a longer haul <coughs> than it necessarily has to be. And it doesn't always necessarily mean that you have to be in D.C. Um, because I know there, there are folks down in D.C. and they're kind of surrounded by this and it's still not always necessarily easy. There are a lot of other plays, places and other ways you can get into this. But again, like I think a lot of people understand and know, finding a job is a job in itself. So let's uh, advance. It doesn't want to advance. 
Are you clicking the arrows? I did that. Yeah. yeah. Well, by golly. Imagine that. Imagine that. Exactly. Is that the next one? Yeah. So what do you mean by it? Seriously. If, if, are there any uh, develop, sustainable development students in here? Can you raise your hands? Two, three, four. Uh, could you tell me what you were hoping to focus on within development? Gentlemen in the back with the best glasses. Um, I mean, you know, they, you hear all the time there's thousands of definitions of what you mean by development. Sure. We're touching on uh, sustainable development. Um, you know, you could, for me at least, I say like it, it, it's some type of improvement in the lives of, of individuals. Um, and of course, that's yeah, so broad, but I mean, it starts there. Mm -hmm. it's really, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain when you talk about improving the lives of individuals, in what way, though? I mean, that's depending on the culture, depending on the context. It could be economic, it could be uh, mental health, it could be, um, you, know, you know, I guess, you know, kind of going to the basic human needs. It could, it could be security, it could be, uh, I forget what it's used. But yeah, I, mean, I guess, you know, it's kind of, and of course, it can be so. Yeah. What, it's also context dependent, but. but yeah. yeah. You mentioned a lot of things there. Um, and these are all, when you're talking about you know, the hierarchy of needs, these are obviously pretty fundamental. Mm -hmm. So, would you say that all of these things are critical to you that you would be interested in, interested in focusing on? Or are there one or two things that really kind of grab you viscerally and uh, don't let go? For me, uh, personally, I, I, uh, I think I'm, I, I'm passionate towards uh, environmental okay. uh, justice and, sure. and, and also in terms of policy advocacy and social justice. So, uh, I'm going to go to the development of our perspectives on this, uh, increasing those opportunities and Right on. Okay. That's still broad, but I'm going to let you off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but no, I appreciate it. Thanks for going there with me. Uh, there's a woman in a pink jacket. In terms of development, what are you focusing on? What are you hoping to do? Uh, I guess I came in with the focus of community development. Okay. Working um, on like empowerment programs in urban communities, locally and internationally. Mm -hmm. um, I guess development was improving quality of life. Mm -hmm. When you talk about improving quality of life in an urban community, would you say education is a particular angle that you would have more interest in than public health or versus housing and property rights, that kind of thing? Uh, I was hoping to figure that out while I was here. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And that's good. And that's important. Thank you. Thank you for letting me dig into your brain. Um, I think the thing that I wanted to Gosh darn, Phil, I don't know what's up with this. Thank you. The thing that I wanted to point out is that you, you both describe things that are, are still within sustainable development within your classes here are so much more specific. Um, but again, when you're talking about the world of development as a career, as a field, they're still pretty broad. Um, so there are folks who come into the program here and they're, they're pretty darn sure of what they want to do. Um, and then there are others who, like yourself, and a lot of ways like me, when I came here, I was like, I know that this is critical to me, I want to do it, I mean, it's part of my identity, and, and, but I don't really know how and where. Um, so I totally understand, to so look at it, we have all been there. Um, what I want to get across is that it's only kind of at the end of your career, really, honestly, that some in development that somebody is going to say, he was a great climate change, social change agent, you know, or she was an incredible Aggie, and she really focused hard on urban agriculture and empowering kids to grow their own food in communities to get involved in that value chain. Um, but when you're at the very beginning, that's not so much the case. Um, so 
there are a few things I'm going to say that might sound kind of contradictory, but I just want to convey some realities as well as I can. Essentially, everybody who works in development, everybody that I work with directly and or hire has done a little bit of everything. So while you are going to be someone who focuses on uh, environmental justice and social justice in terms of access to resources or working in given communities on a certain topic, you're still going to do a lot of different things within that field. And so getting that um, kind of reconciled with what you're doing in classes sooner rather than later is, I think, important. And it will make it kind of less of a, a big cold shock of, of icy water when you get out there. Um, because there are a lot of folks who go into it and they say, I'm definitely doing this and I'm definitely doing that and, you know, we have a 2008 or a late 2007 or whatever it was and then everything gets flipped around. Um, so I guess what I mean to say by this is, while these are things that you're going to focus on and this is critical, it's also very important because you're going to end up doing a lot of things within that field or within that sector, if you will, there's a lot of stuff you're going to have to learn how to do, and some of it you might not like very much, and some of it revolves around Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Um, so if you don't love budgets, if you don't love dealing with math, if you don't like telling people no, <clears throat> I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to get really good at it, especially the budget part, especially the budget part. Um, and again, there are meta categories when you're talking about public health, when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about um, agriculture, when we're talking about land tenure issues. These are very, very broad categories. But within all of them, there are so many hundreds and hundreds and thousands of different positions that one could possibly have and still say, I am a development professional in this or this or this. Um, it's really, it's really what comes down to, like I asked you, what really grabs you viscerally within these things. I think that's the thing that you need to lean toward, because if you end up in something that doesn't grab you in the guts, you're not going to love it, and your work is going to suffer for it, and you're not going to be happy. So, that's my big, you know, him graduate message, is be happy. Um, and I think it's important to remember that there are a lot of complementary skill sets that can be applied to development as broad a field as it is, or pretty much in any degree anybody is doing here. Because if you're looking at uh, positions within social justice, within public advocacy, that kind of thing, you're still going to have to have people who can control your books and run your books. You're still going to have to have people who, who can recruit the people who are going to do this work. Um, you still have to have people who can train. And I can say very assuredly that if you want to be a monitoring and evaluations professional, the world will be your oyster if you want to go into development. There's no question about that. Someone shakes her head. She knows this is true. Yeah. So, lean into your discomfort, as Ken likes to say. Because if you don't, that's not how you're going to get the new skills, and that's not how you're going to grow. And really, ultimately, your career in anything, especially development, is a marathon and not a sprint. And I say this because there are a lot of, I work with a lot of former PIMS as well, and I also see a lot of brand new PIMS coming into our office and applying for jobs. And they want to come in and talk to me about Johari's window, and oh, this, this letter of needs, and I know all about this, and I can tell you about this. Great. We know about this, we've heard about this, we work with this on a regular basis. You need to slow down. Enthusiasm is important, energy is important, but you got to slow down. you got to listen to people more than you got to speak. I think there's a lot of background that goes into getting into that interview point, which I will get to in a minute, but um, I would like you to remember that you are more than your CV. And again, I've been there, I have been in the position where I have been laid off because of budget cuts, because things aren't going so great. And so you have to do everything you possibly can to get yourself out there. And it's very hard, and I know that. Um, and it, like I said, finding a job is a job. 
but I want you to remember that as much as you are more than your CV, and I totally believe that because I see hundreds of them every single day, I know that there is each one of you, each individual person, full of dreams and hopes and disappointments and wants and whatever behind all of that, because we have all been in that position. Um, but I would like you to remember that there are certain things that what I have to look for in a person's CV, for example, and what you have to come put across in your CVs, we say CV just because that's what we use in development world versus resume, um, is I want to see a breadth of experience. I want to see somebody who's really passionate. I want to see somebody who's confident. Good Lord, give yourself some more credit. But, please, unless you are somewhere in your late 40s and fully entrenched in academia, your CV, your slash resume, does not need to be more than two pages. Um, and you need to edit the heck out of that puppy. And I don't want to contradict anything Squeak would say to you or anything any of our staff would say, but I am more than happy to see things that are presented in an unconventional way. Um, if they're original and if they're eye-catching, awesome, more the better, because that's who you are. Give me just a second. I recently <coughs> got one from someone who is a uh, resident in Copenhagen, and he sent a CV using Comic Sans font, <laughs> and he used the landscape format and he didn't use any capital letters. <laughs> and I at first looked at this and I said, oh geez Louise, this is not going to last. This is not going to happen for you, my friend. But I was reading and I was reading and I was reading. He presented things in a way that I hadn't seen before. He, made, he included a little world map and highlighted each of the countries where he'd done short-term consultancies and monitoring evaluation and emergency assistance. And it was yellow and green and blue, and it was kind of crazy, but I really liked it. And I put it in front of somebody in the tech staff, and that's what we call people who work in the sectors, who are dedicated, you know, democracy people or ag people, they're tech staff. Um, and they say, oh, yeah, I know him, he's great. It's like, all right, well, he's obviously going against the grain, and he's a fishy who's swimming upstream, so i got to give him props for that. But honestly, he also wasn't more than two pages. And what he gave us, he gave us dates, he gave us his title, the title of who he was, the title he held. He gave us, these were his basic functions. He gave us highlights, his special achievements, you know, his big results, and he included qualitative and quantitative stuff in there. And he said if he was working for a particular international donor, he mentioned that. Because if you're going to work in development, or if you're going to work in whatever have you, you have to learn who are the big players out there. And you have to learn the rules and regulations within which they do everything. These are basically the boundaries of which, within which you have to color. And it's critical that you learn how they do that so that when you apply for a position with Tetrasec or Chemonics or DAI or whoever, that you're able to say, I've worked for AID, I've worked for AusAid, I've worked for you know, SNV, I've worked for Danita, I've worked for the Swedes, I've worked for whomever, and I know how their rules and regulations work, I'm good to go. Because we want to know, what we want to know is if we're going to put you in the field, that you are not going to look bewildered and slightly terrified at the pile of paper <coughs> that appear on the desk every morning that you have to complete and fill out to us by the end of the day. Because that's kind of how it actually works. So we just want to know that you're going to be quick, that you can hit the ground, not running, but flying almost. Um, and please give yourself some credit when you're doing that. There are, I think, all of us, especially folks who are brought up in the U.S. American context, are going to be a little bit more humble and a little bit more shy and a little bit more on the INF side of Myers-Briggs, and that's totally me, and I get that, because I'm an INFP, but at the same time, you are selling yourself. And it is hard if you have issues relating to speaking in public, or you know if you feel that you have, or there's a learning disability, if you have a physical disability, which is why I'm seated today, um, any of these things. Um, Again, you've got to lean into that discomfort, even physical, for me sometimes, um, without going overboard. But 
again, if you speak uh, probably pretty basic, pretty good, pretty solid Arabic, as I, I think is really picked up here in the past few years as a language of instruction, put that on there because we want to see people who speak a super critical needs language as the State Department calls it. Um, yeah, give yourself credit. And if you, when you do a first draft, send it to the send it to you know however it works nowadays, kind of with Squeak and her staff. But also send it to the professionals who do this kind of thing. But send it to someone who knows you really, really well. Send it to a family member or your best friend or your spouse or your partner or whomever. Someone who can say, oh, you know, you did not mention this thing that you did in 2005 that actually ended up resulting in blah blah blah. We tend to kind of push those things down a little bit because we don't want to be seen as the, the too tall poppy. But your your little poppy head is the one that we need to see. And this is the one I really want to see, like the guy in the landscape format. I would never have called that, but he did a great job. And as I just said, please delineate if you have worked for a big organization, if you have worked for NGOs. I know a lot of people get started that way. Um, mention the ones that you work for. And if you worked for an NGO that's gotten a government grant, mention the agency that distributed the grant. Um, because what we all want to know is that you have worked somehow with some big funding mechanism, some big funding agency, whether it be the U.S. government or one of its many, many agencies or bureaus, whether it's the World Bank, ditto. Um, whether it is um, the ADB, whether, you know, any major, major, major funder like this. And I know that it sucks to think of defining oneself as the bank that one has worked for and as an NGO baby myself and a child of federal workers. I totally get that and I feel that. But again, it's also saying I know how to work within their particular little sandbox. I know how they do the things. I can do it. I can follow those rules. I know what you're looking for. I know what you're not looking for. That's really... Does that rub anybody completely the wrong way? Does that freak anybody out? And good. Okay. Um, and be honest. Uh, so give yourself credit, but don't lie, obviously. <laughs> because what's going to happen is when if you put on your CV that your French is um, fluent, and what we will do is we will look at that and say, okay, does that equivocate to basically the Foreign Service Institute Level 5 or FSI 5, which is what any U.S. funding agency is using as kind of their language descriptor. Um, they are going to have part of your interview in that language. And that's going to be verbal and spoken and conversational, but it's also probably going to be written, and you might have to provide a writing sample in that language. Uh, we have a former colleague, Maria, uh, whose parents are Argentinian. She speaks Spanish fluently since she was a child, obviously. And we have people come in and say, oh, my Spanish is fluent. She'll come in there and she will ask them a bunch of questions, and she will come out saying, sorry, you're intermediate. And it sucks, and it's a rude awakening, but we work in these languages. We need to know that you can do the same. But remember that you are more than your CV. And that's kind of what I want to get to next. Um, networking is something I kind of refer to as friendly exploitation. Because as PIMS, as Matt's, um, as anybody who comes out of here, you are part of a enormous and pretty incredible network of people who are working in places you never would have thought to find somebody who knows anything about SIT or world learning. There is an incredible networker in here, and please, please, please use it. Use the hell out of it, because that's why it is there. And like we used to say at the beginning of the year, like we give this speech and we're really excited that you're here and blah, blah, blah. Basically, the program that you're working through now and as painful and as gut-wrenching it is, as it is, and I know it is, um, is in part the way it is because of classes of people like you who came before you and who had to deal with the same thing. And you pushed for change and you pushed for change and you felt a lot of the same things. 
and they had their own particular ideas about what the campus experience should look like, what the classroom should look like, um, what the people in the classroom should look like, what the practicum should be like, how do you design a practicum, what should that include, and how are you realistically graded on all of this stuff. So your network is here for you, and we're not necessarily going to help you out unless you ask. So I help out former PIMS quite a bit. Um, they get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I totally welcome that. That's fine. Um, and they say, you know, if you're three degrees connected from somebody, I can't reach out to somebody through your knees. Basically, you get what I'm saying. Establish a relationship with people, whether it's me or whether it's, you know, other PIMS who are coming in to give presentations. Talk to them. Listen. Because there's that saying that you're born with two ears but one mouth. And I think that's very critical, especially in anything CT related, but especially in development as well. Um, so you have to get out there and you have to rub elbows and you have to mix with people. And where can you do that? Obviously, you can do that from here, um, but you can also do that from Boston. You can do that from D.C., you can do that from New York, I think we all know that. But if you don't want to be in these places, or if you are not, you know, kind of visa bound to be able to stay here, and you need to be international, then be international. Research the organizations that are out there, that are working in the things that really grab you. Um, find out where they're located. Some of the bigger centers of those places are what I listed. Uh, Rome, if you're interested in anything at all related to agricultural food or food, uh, Rome is someplace you're eventually probably going to visit, which is terrible. Um, same for land tenure. Um, Istanbul, if you're related to a lot of stuff that's going on in the Middle East at the moment, which is changes on a dime, um, especially related to relief and, and development, obviously. Um, a crop, uh, a lot of organizations, a lot of NGOs, universities there are doing a lot of work throughout Western Africa and bits of Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think Ghana is viewed as one of the more stable democracies in Western Africa. If you want to quibble with that statement, that is fine. Um, I totally understand, but I'm just telling you what I know, and this is, that's kind of why we're here. I just want to share with you what I can. Um, does anybody here have a Twitter handle? Please raise your hand. Awesome. Uh, do you tweet every day? What do you tweet about? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Mm, it's more of my um, outlet. <laughs> my, my angry outlet. <laughs> 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 because you it's very limited, like the people you can let in. Yeah. It's really superficial how I use it. I look at celebrities and um, I am following like the Peace Corps and things like that. And mm -hmm. I just kind of read it and tweet to my like best friends if we're making plans or something like that. But again, it's very personal and kind of superficial. Gotcha. And that's all right. <laughs> we're going to an outlet. There was one over here as well who are tweeters. Yes, ma'am. I rarely use my Actually, I use it to keep up with my friends. Okay. It seems like such a big investment of time to figure out how it works and then read it all the time. So I think I need a Twitter. To <laughs> that but I can see how it's helpful. Yeah. Uh, Squeak, is that something you talk about? We talk about social media. Yeah. Um, Generally, most of our students don't tweet. Okay. You know, and I don't know if that's something that we need to really ramp up, but you know, we sort of hold them, and it's, it's surprisingly low. Most people, yeah. and, and even at the beginning when they're starting, you know, classes, mm -hmm. the amount of students that are using LinkedIn is also very, very low. Really. It's really low. But by the time they yeah. leave campus, you know, just what everyone had a LinkedIn account. Oh good. You know. Oh good. Could yeah. LinkedIn right now? Question, please. Sweet, I'm really happy to see that. Um, perfect, because you need to be on LinkedIn, period. Period. Um, and if you're not very good at social media, and I know it's an investment of time, you really need to get good at it. Uh, and I hate to say that. But if you are, you can start separate accounts. I mean, you can have like five, six, seven, however the heck many you want. You have them for separate things. We all have them for separate things. 
and what you do, but how we use it, and how the U.S. government is using it, and how major international funders are using it, and how NGOs are using it, and how recruiters are using it, is we're trying to find people who are active and who are thought leaders, period. So again, it's all about selling yourself, and I know that sucks because it shouldn't be that way, and it should be about who you are and what you are, because I do believe that you are more than your CV, but I can't get into your heads all the time, and I can't give you props unless I know that you are interested in something and you put out there that you saw something, you're connected to something, this is your thought on it. Like, I want to know that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I follow a lot of people. I'm followed by a surprising weird range of people. Um, and I tweet a lot about policy um, and about politics and somewhat about culture, um, but I'm more interested, and this is just my own dork thing, just because I'm a big nerd for that kind of stuff. But um, we also have separate Twitters, each of our recruitment folks and a lot more of our regular kind of senior associate and associate staff, because they are thought leaders in their fields. I would say, as an example of that, um, our staff has done more for land tenure and property rights issues uh, probably more than any other company in this country, which is really incredible to say. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're going into Libya very soon. And that's a secret I'm telling all of you, by the way. Uh, we're going into Libya very soon in part because in 1977, Gaddafi uh, put into action something called Law Number 4. And I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but it was news to me. But he essentially said that every person, this sounds very similar to a lot of other authoritarian regimes that we've seen around the world and what ends up happening. Law number four says that each person can only own one property. And so the subsequent results of that, I think we can all kind of figure out what happens from there. Um, fast forward however many years later we are, and the man is gone. And now we see all of these families with all of their very, very old claims on large parts of Tripoli and large parts of Benghazi, on huge districts throughout the southern part of the country, who are saying, I have this, uh, this is mine, my family has always lived here. And no, I don't have documentation, because they never needed it. So we're going to go in there and help kind of reconcile some of these impromptu, I just popped up reconciliation commissions that are going to say, okay, all of you guys have to leave now because this belongs to me. Um, in terms of working with that and kind of mitigating, all right, we understand you are trying to do something good here and reconciling the legacy of this, but the reality is we have to work through not just national and local kind of rules and regulations as they are being drafted at the moment, but also international law if you actually want your property rights recognized. So that's just one example of that kind of thing. But I would say that the folks who are working on that kind of thing um, are getting on Twitter, and these are old white guys. And they're really, really, really hesitant to even like do LinkedIn. They're like, oh, I put my name on it. You know, and so you go and open their profile and there's nothing there. It's like, that's great. And again, what I have to get through to them and what they're slowly understanding is that we want to see your Rolodex. We want to see who you're connected to. I mean, yeah, you're connected to your classmates, but you should also be connected to your faculty. You should be connected to that lady over there, um, that lady over there, that guy right there. Um, because these are your networks, and these are what you need to call upon. These are the things you need to, in a friendly way, explain. Um, so don't be shy. Um, don't be lazy. Be relaxed. Um, but maintain your confidence. I don't know how else to put this other than be natural. I mean, when you, when you reach out to somebody and say, oh, I really love a connection. Can you introduce me all the time to this person? I will say yes. Uh, but I can't do that, and I can't say that with any confidence unless you send me your CV. So how about you send me your CV or resume to this address, and I'll review it, and I'll be able to more confidently and more kind of holistically give my thumbs up on your candidacy and kind of what 
skill set you would bring to that particular position or that particular organization. And I've done this with PIMS and some of them, you know, more recent classes of PIMS and they said, oh, can you connect? But again, it's like, listen, yes, I'm happy to do that, but we, you've got to be a little bit more high context here. Talk to me, tell me who you are, tell me what you're interested in, tell me where you want to be, tell me where you've been, send me your resume that hopefully reflects all of that, and it's only two pages. And then, I'm more than happy to do that. I'm more than happy to do that. I need a little bit of time because, again, I get overwhelmed by my own calendar, much less everybody else's. Um, so, keep it natural, keep it relaxed, but again, confident, but don't be too relaxed. It, you got to be a little bit more high context, I think, in development. And I, I would say part of that is due to the fact that a lot of the folks who are kind of at the top of that field right now, at the top of that game in development, are the guys who were the first, the guys and gals who were the first classes of Peace Corps volunteers in the 60s. So they have all of these great stories about all this great stuff they did in the 60s, and they did great stuff. But at the same time, they are now in their 60s. And many of them are old white men. And so, and I'm not saying that to slam on old white men, because we all know some who are cool that we love. Um, but what I'm saying is you have to understand where they're coming from and you have to be able to work with them, not against them. You have to be a little bit more high context, but you also have to be a little bit more respectful. Um, and just enthusiasm, energy, yes, bring it. But bring it in a little bit more controlled way. <laughs> Don't lecture me about Joe Harvey's window at your interview, man. Because I know about it. I taught it when I taught Obi-Wan and Claire Halverson for Pete's sake. Um, and please remember that at the end of the day, it's just talking. Networking is just talking. And whether it's an informational interview, whether you call and miraculously get one of us at our desks and say, can I ask you a couple of questions? Can I bounce something off of you? Can I get your input? Yes, of course you can. It's just talking. So I don't want... I, I, what I really hope doesn't happen is that people get so kind of built up and so kind of nervous and so energized and so like I really want to do this well that you just kind of crack and you're sweating and you're nervous and you got the shakes that at the end of the day, it's right you see, that at the end of the day you end up forgetting what you wanted to say and practice for the love of Pete, practice. It's just talking because you're more than your CV. Again, this is where it comes in because I'm going to get that. And this is just an example. We recently posted, we still have a couple, I just want to check my time, of uh, positions for assistant project managers on our website. And we need one that especially is a strong Spanish speaker. And by strong, I mean fluent. And by fluent, I mean actually fluent, not intermediate or not elementary, no offense. Get there, just work on it. Uh, we had 400 applications for this one position. That is really demoralizing to hear. So what I implore to you is because you are more than your CV, please network. Please, when you're in DC, or if you're in DC, when you're in Brattleboro, or if you're in DC, when you're in London, for example, reach out to people ahead of time, research them, see where they have been, Find common threads with these folks. Engage with them as people because it is just talking. Engage with them as people. Listen. Listen. you got to be a little bit more high context, but just listen. Because you're more than your CV, and they want to know about you. I swear to God. So ask me anything, because I want to know about you. But um, this isn't any particularly new information. I just want to know what your questions are. I will tell you whatever you want to know right now. Ask me. Doesn't matter. Do you want to know what format your CV should look like? Do you want to know, can you connect on LinkedIn? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Um, what do you want to know? What does anybody want to know? Yes, thank you. I just want to know how did it take for you to find a job after you finish at 
I already worked at SIT while I was doing my practicum in Capstone. So afterward you just, you finished your Capstone and then you just went on to work with SIT? Yep, I continued working here. I started working in the admissions office January 2nd of 2002. And I kept on going and it took me a little bit longer due to life getting in the way to do my Capstone. Uh, but I finished it and I kept on working in admissions. I also was fortunate to be able to do some teaching. Um, but then I switched, I uh, left SIT for an opportunity in Boston and I stayed down there for a couple of years and I continued to work in higher ed. And I said, you know what, for the life of me, this is not what I want to be doing. I enjoy it, I love it, and in a lot of ways I really miss it, but it, it doesn't, development gets me in my guts. So that's where I came from. How did you transition? I networked like crazy. I started tweeting a lot, and then what I was doing was I always fancied myself one of those really ridiculous, blowhard, wonky panelists on the McLaughlin Group. I don't know if you're familiar with this show on PBS, but it's kind of ridiculous. But I always thought, how awesome to be able to say, what's going to happen next week? Just be, okay, so you're seeing what's going, and what do you think is going to happen? So I just started doing this, and then lo and behold, like the head of the FAO started following me, and I was like, who the hell am I? I'm just some chick who lives in Salem, Mass., um, you know, going off. So that started happening, and I networked, and I networked, and I networked with people that I knew, with my classmates, with people who weren't my classmates, and then I finally got my foot in the door and got my interview. So it was probably about three very three or four very unpleasant months, but thankfully I lived in the Commonwealth of Mass where you can have unemployment. <laughs> so I was really grateful for that. Under Romney? Oh! oh <laughs> <laughs> no. Dude, ouch. Oh, I, um, I sure, DC, go ahead. Do you have a question, DC? No. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would like to know either what your, either your opinion or experience on what RPCVs can do. RPCVs can do a lot, and I think a lot of people think that you're automatic in <coughs> in development, and it can be if you make it. Um, I, I think it's really easy for you. To therefore, when you apply for that position at whatever development firm or for whatever development project somebody's recruiting for to say, yes, I have two years of experience in this country, yes, I speak this at this level, boom, 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 boom. It's easier for you to tick off a lot of boxes, but I think it also doesn't kind of negate the networking thing and it doesn't negate the CV thing. So I think it's, it gives you a leg up. I don't think it's necessarily for everybody and it's not. I didn't do Peace Corps, and that's okay, I did AmeriCorps, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but I think it does help a lot, and it, it makes people look at you possibly a second time if they see that you have been in some place like Turkmenistan, where one of my newer colleagues was for three years. Turkmenistan, of all places, which doesn't even have a Peace Corps anymore. So, I mean, something like that can really say, this person is tenacious, maybe a little crazy, um, but I appreciate their drive. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I guess maybe a better no, okay. question is that whether or organizations see that kind of volunteerism mm -hmm. as equating to work, or whether they see that? Um, it's, like, it's not like how do they share sure. that experience? Sure. The question was just for DC, it was kind of basically do organizations like ours see time in Peace Corps or volunteerism as work and I think we kind of do uh, because so many of us are our PCVs um, and we kind of do and I say kind of because we know the reality is you're not always doing that you're often doing you know community development you're doing a little bit of everything but I think it really what it comes down to is how much you sell again the the main thrust of what you did. Were you a hardcore economic development person and you were embedded within a particular office or something like that? Or were you working in a classroom and you built out a particular resource of this school, hence this community, et cetera, et cetera. It's how much you, it's really like anything in life, and this is another cheesy thing, it is how much you make of it. 
So if you really write it up, then it counts for work in my eyes. Is that helpful? Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. What would be your suggestion or your thoughts on trying to like um, incorporate other types of experience besides development experience? Um, kind of. Could you say a little bit more about that? Um, well, like I've been in the business world for the last 12 years, you know, yeah. in sales and marketing, mm -hmm. and so it's. But I don't have any development, so but it, it still has to have some value, of course, in in some way. So how sure. do you? sell that side of, even though it's not direct, you know, the companies you work for aren't necessarily like the names or the, you know, the yeah. people that you're selling. So yeah. Much. What were you doing within all of that? Were you strict marketing? Were you strict sales? Were you, were you overseeing people? Were you a budget lady? I was not. I've okay. I ran budgets, but okay. I've done all of that. Yeah. Okay. In different capacities. Okay. This is a good question. Um, the question for DC was, if I'm coming from a dozen years in the business field, in the for-profit world, how do I spin it? I think it really depends on what do you want to focus on, honestly. Uh, because I think a lot of people will look at you and say, oh, you would be, you know, if I'm opening a new project in Kosovo and I really need a communications person and I really need somebody who's going to run PR for us because all of these projects need a face and they need somebody to write their reports and they need someone to interface with the USAID mission or other local stakeholders, other local NGOs, this kind of thing. Um, you could be a communications person, you could, which obviously is a huge part of marketing. Um, if you want to be in sales, I mean, shoot, there are a lot of ways you could spend that. If you wanted to, if you wanted to stay strictly in numbers, there are a lot of ways you could do that. If you didn't want to, um, then you would look more at the relational side. Um, again, the recruiting, the project managing, um, the, uh, gosh, business, you could even potentially, there's a lot of work that's happening now, especially kind of after we do the ag projects, after we do the democratization and governance, we do the public-private partnership stuff, which is, Again, feels weird for an NGO baby to kind of be saying that kind of thing. But again, if you don't have anything going in terms of the private sector, it's not going to look very good for a lot of people for a long time. So public-private partnerships could be something that you specialize on in terms of building alliances and building local kind of business associations. That kind of there are a lot of ways you could spin that. If you want to be a contracts manager, people would kiss the ground and walk on. Again, it's people, and God, I know it sounds ridiculous, but again, there's so many people who come into it with such great intentions and they want to do so much, but you have to be comfortable leaning into your discomfort and doing the stuff that people don't want to do. And a lot of what people don't want to do is numbers. So what, does that mean what's one of the best ways to find out, I mean, you, you know, monitoring and validation, yeah. you keep hearing the thing that yeah. they need that, but what's one of the best ways to sort of know what these kind of companies are really needing? Look at their websites. Look at their website. There is a website I didn't put on here, but if you want to write it down, it's called. Uh, if you Google uh, CIDC, and I think it's called um, Advancing American Ingenuity or American Ingenuity Abroad, if you Google that, essentially, what that is is the Council of International Development Companies. And this is essentially something that our company joined a couple of years ago with all the big players in DC, with a lot of the big NGOs. Essentially, we were looking at the midterm elections in 2010 and everybody's saying, how much the foreign assistance budget takes up on the Fed? No, 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 it doesn't take up 25% of the federal budget, it takes up 0.1, 0.1%. So what this was is basically just like, a big group of people who would get together and say we have to advocate for ourselves because we don't know what's coming in the next election. And if elections turn out a certain way this fall, it's going to be really interesting, really quickly. Um, so if you go to that website, that was a sidebar, sorry. If you go to that website, you will see the names and it will link to all of the websites of all of these places. And there are a lot of them on there. I think there are 30 something. Um, the big players in international development are us. Tetra Tech, is, the corporation is based in Pasadena, California. 
uh, ARD is a recent acquisition. Um, we've tended to do rural development and mostly ag stuff, but we're doing more, a lot of global climate change stuff and a lot of climate justice. Um, uh, land tenure, like I said, democracy and governance, water resources, infrastructure, but we're also getting into kind of emergency response and um, kind of transition initiative. So if you also Google OTI, which is the Office of Transition Initiatives, which is, which is in US AID, those are kind of like the first responders for aid. So they have an office, office sorry, still going in Syria, for example or they're getting ready to go in there. They're just kind of like sitting at the border, like freaking out like can they get in there. They've been going in Libya for quite a while. So again, that website is going to link you to a lot of different places. And it's, it's again, finding a job is a job. And I hate to say that, but it's the truth. Um, but explore websites as much as you can. If you go to the USAID website, if you go to the DFID, the DFID, if you Google DFID, that is the British kind of equivalent of USAID uh, website, and see the things that they are working on. Um, and it will give you a sense of the uh, contractors who do the work for them. We are one of them as well. Uh, but look at the projects that they do. And again, a lot of what is coming and the jobs that are going to be really necessary in development is again kind of this forecasting, which I think is where my little geek I want to be on the McLaughlin group thing kind of came in handy because again it's kind of if you're looking at this trend these are the political conditions this is the skill set that I have this is what might happen and this is what I'm going to have to get good at and what I can say for pretty much anybody and I'm so sorry who wants to work in development is Excel I'm sorry is that helpful yeah okay okay I mean it's not really yeah, I mean, exactly, and this is great, so you're going to be fine, but really, it's, it's just, it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. That's really the best I can tell you. I'm sorry. Yes, straight to her. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay, um, being a former PIM student, I want to know what was your experience being here, mm -hmm. and out of all the opportunities that you had to be here, you know, apart from just academic, either bettering your languages or bettering certain skills, what do you think is the most, most valuable for us to focus on when we're here? I think it's critical to focus on social justice stuff. I think it's critical to focus on conflict transformation. I think it's critical to remember the lessons of OB1. They don't have OB1 anymore? Foundations. Foundations, thank you. It's like support government, but yes. <laughs> remember the lessons of that first initial class that you had because that is going to come into, that's going to call into play the conflict stuff your social justice stuff, your identity stuff, your organizational development stuff, absolutely everything. Because every single one of us are working teams, period, all the time. I work with rotating teams constantly. There are some people who drive me batty, but I still got to work with them. <laughs> and I still got to remember, I'm leaning into my discomfort. I am leaning so much, I'm practically horizontal, but I am getting <laughs> that well. And that's all right, because you know, that's how you grow, that's how you learn, that's how you change. Foundations, is that what it's called? Yeah. Just what, foundations. What does OB1 stand for? Organizational <laughs> Behavior 1. Yeah. Then people will be one can be the subsequent joke. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I, you know, honestly, the, the, the lessons of those classes are invaluable. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'll get to your question in just a moment. Um, sorry, DC, the question was kind of what was critical in, in time on campus working in development now, and I think, again, it's those aforementioned intangibles that come out of your social justice stuff, your conflict stuff, your foundations class. Um, because, again, you got to work in teams, and nobody works alone, and if they work alone, it doesn't look good, sorry. Um, you got to work alone, but you got to be responsive to a team. Sir, sorry, yes. Um. Full disclosure, it, it, yeah. it, 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 it kind of upset me a little. So I want to confirm. No, that please. Reiterate. So is it standard practice that HR departments look at people's LinkedIn accounts and Twitter accounts? No. So, you know, no. Oh, okay. It's not standard practice. It, the question was is it standard practice that HR looks at people's social media? Um, it's not standard practice, but in some places it is. That's just the reality. I can't change that. Yeah. Um, 
They just want to know, are you, are you, don't, I mean, I think the common sense thing is don't do silly stuff in those pictures of it. You know, I don't think it's standard when we're hiring someone, you know, who's going to go into the field, but I think it comes into play when, especially when we are going into conflict zones, and especially when we're going to places that have seen a lot of intractable conflict, um, it can be problematic. It's been problematic in Afghanistan for us in a very large way. A lot of things in Afghanistan are problematic, as we know, unfortunately. But um, the question, I understand where you're coming from, because obviously you should be able to have a life and do all that sort of thing and get that. Um, I'm not opposed to that, but I think you can also have more than one account. But I don't think you should go crazy and publicize it on a computer, kind of ever. I should go to school with that. I don't do it at all. Okay. Um, oh, listen here. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I'm like, I, I really, really have to start doing this. Yeah. I, I kind of don't want to. Uh, Why is it? Why don't you want to? You know, friendly exploitation. You know, these things I had to personally get over, I guess, but I guess, yeah. you know, I I don't like that concept at all at the I understand. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that, you know, I don't want you kids to like, debate about that, but, you know, I was just, I was just curious. No, I understand. Um, I understand. I think, I think the idea is we're going to look at your CV, but you are more than that. Mm -hmm. And so when we are looking at these 399 other CVs that come in for an assistant project manager position, which after a year um, is promoted to a project manager and you are in the field a lot, uh, we want to know more about you. And if that's good or bad, we want to know it. And so if all these other folks are doing this and are writing and they're publishing this, online, you can do that. That's totally cool. People have po uh, posted their blog spot stuff where they're writing a lot of really interesting stuff about why they don't like Red Plus and climate change issues, and I get that. But that's part of the scene right now. It's, it's a reality we have to function with it. I'm not a fan of it myself either. But it's just, it's one of those things we gotta swallow, um, and it doesn't taste good, and you just gotta be smart about it. It's just gotta be common sense. And you can keep it to a bare minimum, you can keep your social media to a bare, bare, bare minimum. But at least be there. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Are there more questions while I'm spilling my hands? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Am I correct in saying, did you um, work with youth groups at all? Um, like in terms of development and social change? A little bit, yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Um, that's something I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be here more about that experience. I don't know if we can do it now or like maybe after um, and just like maybe like the tools you use or like if you found it effective or things like that. Right. I would say, um, and, and I know, it's friendly, it's friendly though, it's friendly exploitation. It's friendly. It's friendly. Um, there's a lot going on here about that and on campus, especially during the summer, so I would recommend getting in on that as soon as you possibly can. And try to be in touch with my friend Simon Norton, who is impossible to find, because I'm trying to talk to him. What's that? He's not around. Ah, he's got a kayak or a bike or... <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got hair and a scrunchie. <laughs> Bye! Um, there's a lot going on here around that, so I would try to learn a lot about that as soon as you can. Um, talk to Sweet, she knows, she knows everything. Um, talk to these fine folks from Context as well, because not, I think there's a lot that goes on kind of adult peace building that translates a lot into uh, youth programs. Um, I understand there's a class in that here now, is that correct? There's kind of a, there's a course and you kind of, yeah. That's awesome. Are you going to take that? You should yeah. take that. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, that's I huge. Like oh, right on. Did you like it? Oh, yeah. Right on. Nice. Who was the instructor? Uh, that was Simon, Simon and John. Oh, yeah, they talk really fast. Really great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right on. No, that's wonderful. That's really great. Um, I would try to talk to John if you can. Um, and network, holy heck, while you're on campus. And especially when the Career fair, can I do a little plug? Please. Uh, is it called a career fair? 
called a career fair. It's called a career fair. It's going to be here next week. Next, next week. week. Yeah, Tuesday the 23rd. Yeah. Um, and this is, again, not necessarily I'm looking for a job. This is networking, networking, networking. Totally. Even if the person that's standing in that room does not have the job that you want, you want to know that person in that room because yep. they know people who know what you want. Yep. Networking. Yeah, that's the whole idea. And 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 again, that's really friendly exploitation committee. It's friendly. <laughs> and ultimately, honestly, when I am getting resumes and resumes and resumes and applications that kind of make your head spin, if I see PIMS, I want to interview a PIM. Period. And I think there are a lot of other PIMS who are out there who feel the same way. Because we know what this place can do to you and can't do for you. <laughs> and what it means, and what it means for a lot of other people who come through these sources. Hello. Um, yeah, I want to hire PIMS. I always want to hire PIMS. I had the chance to hire one that too long ago, and I regret that I uh, said no. Um, because the, the friendly exploitation was, uh, that really wasn't quite there. And also, there was not, a, there was a little bit too much confidence. There was more talking than there was listening. And it's like, you know, I know, I know, you're so energized and you really want to go, 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 and you want to hit the ground running, and that's great, but slow down. Listen to what we need and then tell us that you can give us that. Please don't tell us everything you are going to do straight away because not everyone's going to come through and transform the universe with a wave of their hand. Please listen and then we'll have a dialogue. That's what it comes down to, listening and dialogue. And a friendly exploitation. So again, the thing that I just want you to go away with is I know that applying for jobs, especially in development, can be a huge pain because you send your CV and oh my god, it's a ride and squeak, can you look at this? And people, and inevitably, it happens every single week, I get a CV where somebody means to write public and what do they end up typing? <laughs> <laughs> they write pubic. And I understand because I have been there. <laughs> Nobody is perfect. But please, please, please edit. Please take third and fourth looks. Please talk to folks who are really close to you. Does this sound like me? What am I forgetting? If you were not even to know me, would this sound like someone that you'd want to talk to, to have a dialogue with? Again, somebody that you'd want to ask questions of and have questions asked of you. That's what it all comes down to for me, I think. I love development. Development is awesome. Our calendars are crazy. Uh, they're ridiculous. And I was late this morning because I was working on Libya stuff and Tanzania stuff that I thought I was finished with yesterday at 7.30 at night. Um, we have to work on the government's calendar, and the government does not have a lot of patience for so um, it's it's uh, the rat race term is very much apropos. Um, then you gotta get comfortable with it, as gross as it may taste when you swallow it. But it's all right. It's good. It's satisfying. Am I good? <coughs> all right. Thank you. There's no switch on that. Okay. All right. Thank Never you, mind. folks, for coming. Um, yeah.